Here we go. Hello, movie watchers, and welcome to episode seven of The Lunar's Cut, your place for long-form, raw, unedited discussions about a TV show or movie that we are passionate about this week. I'm Kevin Kane, that's Travis Moon, and join us on the edge of those seats. If this is your first time here, welcome. We are glad you're joining us for this discussion. Secondly, what is the show? The Lunar's Cut is our safe space to talk about TV shows and movies. Each week, we pick a show or movie that we're passionate about and have a discussion on. Plot, visuals, cinematography, leaps and logic, weird tangents, anything and everything in between. For about an hour and a half is what we aim for. These two idiots talk your ears off until we've exhausted your mind holes about the movie or show that week. This week, I'm pretty sure, is this count as your pick, Travis, or is it my pick? I mean, we both wanted to do this one, but I'm pretty sure it's technically your pick. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> we're going to call it your pick. Uh, so your your pick this week was Us uh, by the writer and director Jordan Peele, of course, who, wrote, uh, who did Get Out. That was his debut, direct, or direct, directorial debut. Uh, this is his second film. Um, before we get too much into that, let's do some housekeeping. Where can you watch us? This show is part of Moon Movie Review YouTube channel. Also, you can find us in podcast forms on various podcast services out there, including podcasts and Spotify, as of now. As always, links to all of those will be in the description. Shout out to Dan and the crew at Crowd in Town Creative for awesome intro and audio music. You can find them for your creative needs at www.crowdintown.com. I think I said four W's, but it's three. It's fine. Anyway, let's see us. Uh, let's start with your thoughts, Travis. What overall your your pre-spoiler review of this movie? Go. I absolutely loved just about everything in the movie. Um, I was really looking forward to it. It was high on my list ever since I saw the first trailer. Um, it wasn't as good as I was hoping it was going to be. Um, and ultimately for me, the only thing I didn't like was the ending. Uh, the ending just kind of let it down, let me down a little bit. Um, but other than that, I think everything else about the movie is absolutely phenomenal. And I would definitely recommend you watching it. Although I will say this, it's not really a horror movie. It starts off that way and it feels that way, in my personal opinion. And then as you get through the movie, it kind of goes away from the horror and into something different, which I still enjoyed, but it just wasn't like what I thought, which is okay. Yeah, no, it definitely, it, there's two specific horror tropes. Uh, again, tropes isn't necessarily a negative word. Uh, there's two tropes it ties into their big horror themes. I've been around for a long time. You got the home invasion horror trope. Uh, movies like the Sh uh, Stranger, the Strangers, 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 Strangers. Yeah, yeah. You know, perfect example of that. And then you have the invasion uh, catastrophe type trope, right? Where a, a people come and take over. Uh, so it's very much in line with those, and it's definitely ho horror inspired. And uh, but I do get what you're kind of saying, and I'm. I was more calling it a thriller, yeah. and I know there's stupid delineations between the two, like horror, thriller, yeah. thriller, horror, but uh, I get what you mean by that. And there, there is very much, I think there is a portion of this movie that is horror. Um, I will never listen to Fuck the Police in the same tense again <laughs> after this movie. Uh, similar to the that one song on Quentin Tarantino's uh, The Reservoir Dogs, where... Uh, that dude starts to torture uh, that guy in the chair, and he has that really awesome song. Like, uh, I I can't listen to that song without yeah. thinking of that scene right. where he he tortures <laughs> that dude with a knife. The same vibe, right? When I it was it was that Beach Boys song, and I was like, I'm never gonna think of Beach Boys song ever again. But I don't listen to Beach Boys; it's not that big a deal. And then you know, N.W.A. Fuck the police! I'm like, oh man, now this song is just gonna be. <laughs> yeah, it's always gonna be the uh, best movie from now on. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I, I really enjoy this movie. Uh, I don't think I had necessarily, it's weird for horror movies for me to have expectations. Uh, this is an original, uh, uh, movie and the original, uh, from top to bottom. So like, yeah, I did, there was no script, original screenplay. Yeah. Like the whole thing. Yeah. There was no like Halloween had expectations. The, the, the latest one, right? Mm -hmm. This movie I didn't, but it, there was, I guess maybe certain because I like get out so much that, uh, but I, I didn't really have as ex expectations like I normally have in movies, right? So I was, I, I enjoyed it. But I, I definitely left saying that is not 
if you were thinking you were getting another get out, it's not that. And I think you could be disappointed if that's what you were expecting. Um, because like I said, it's an original movie. It's not like it's a get out too, uh, or in the same universe. Right. Right. Um, I guess it could I be. Never in the same saw it. I never saw get out. So really, yeah, I've got, Maybe. I've got nothing to compare it to, you know, uh, I've only heard great things about get out and I only, you know what I mean? And I, I genuinely believe that with, uh, Jordan Peele as a content creator, believe he's perfect for this type of thing, you know, and I think he does phenomenal work. Um, I, I really don't like most of their comedies and skits as like Jordan and Peele and stuff like that. A lot of them are like absolutely hilarious, but most of their stuff that I don't like, I don't dislike it. I just, you know what I mean? It's just, it's not my cup of tea. Yeah. It's just not my genre, I guess. Um, but I know like I've seen a lot of footage of him like behind the scenes and him looking at him like that from the, from that perspective feels right. Feels like he, you know, it feels like as a content creator, his ability to write and his ability to envision things and to bring that vision to life, that all feels right. So I can only, I've only heard good things about Get Out. I can only imagine it's a fantastic movie, but I've not watched it yet. So this yeah. for me, I've, I've ultimately, this is my Jordan Peele directorial and screenplay debut for me. Gotcha. So. gotcha. so, yeah, no, this is a great movie. I, I think. If you were a fan of Get Out, I think you would enjoy this, uh, as long as you're not expecting, like I said before, Get Out 2. I think if you are a horror fan, you'll still enjoy this. Uh, I do feel this movie does leave a lot of unanswered questions, and depending on your cup of tea, if I can bring that, that back, you might dislike that. Uh, you might want those questions answered. But definitely Get Out uh, has a bunch of questions that get answered. Right? There's, you leave that movie not thinking about well what a you know well, what what ha what, what, what happened with this um it's pretty much ties it in a bow this movie kind of leaves a lot of que uh, questions unanswered and i've never had an issue with that kind of thing um this is a small story about this family and another family right and but in the world there's a bigger story going on and we don't get to you know figure out what's totally going on with that story but that's what makes you know this is a story this isn't like a uh, an epic tale where we're going to have you know, who knows if we even have a sequel to this he said he would he would want to do he would be up for doing a movie in this universe but he doesn't need to uh at least for my opinion um yeah. i don't know how you would maybe it'd just be another pers another person's perspective ultimately it, or the past prequel figure out what happened there you know i'm not trying I to spoil the crew as much as i can like uh but yeah i think this is a good movie i uh you know my test is would I buy this and put it on my DVD show? Yeah, I would. Uh, yeah. It has a great performance of Lupita. Uh, Lupita. Yes. I forget Lupita her last name. Nyong'o. Yes. Uh, she, of course, was in Black Panther. That's where I first saw her. I think she's been in a lot of other more uh, award-worthy movies than Black Panther, uh, as far as like uh, I think better performances. She was yeah, like she was great in that movie, but she's a smaller part. And in this movie, she's really got the stretch her acting chops out. Yes. Of course. Another movie trope is the, uh, uh, not even horror movie trope necessarily, but the doppelganger trope is fully expressed in this movie. And we always have, we have two people acting two different ways. And I think everyone does a really good job of that, but especially her, because we get so much time with both of her characters. And she just shines. She was fantastic. And it bums me out. Like I told you, so now we have to watch Get Out and we have to watch Hereditary. It bums <laughs> me out that the main actress didn't get nominated for any awards from Hereditary because she did amazing but i i guess i get why horror is a hard genre to be put in the oscars yeah, for, for sure. a lot of people but it wasn't necessarily that i would suggest a horror movie be in in line for best picture but that performance unarguably was amazing and just like lupita in this one like it would be really upsetting if she didn't get any recognition for this performance she put in um, but yeah, so that's kind of our spoiler free review. We kind of want to get into it. So go see this movie. If we could convince you, awesome. Have a good time. Uh, spoiler free now, or spoilers now. We're leaving the spoiler zone, or we're entering the spoiler zone. Uh, so <laughs> it really bums me out that you haven't watched Get Out and you don't understand his production company, uh, Monkey Paw Productions, where you have that little teacup uh -huh. with uh, the. The He's staring, staring on the train. 
that's a huge part of get out like immediately i, I heard it and i was like oh god oh really oh god <laughs> oh god here we go and then and then that's just, you know then you realize this is just the intro to his production company i was like that's perfect awesome so when we watch get out and we'll probably do an episode on it if you want to you'll know once you watch the movie like oh yeah yeah there we go i probably shouldn't have ruined it for you but it's fine um so, no, I, I really enjoyed this movie. I think there are a lot of themes. Like, the main theme is, I mean, it's kind of in the title, Us. Us is super ambivalent. There's no clear reason what he meant by it. But I think the point of this movie is to show that there's always an us and there's always a them. And that's right. kind of like the under th- underlying theme of this entire movie. Uh, you could say grass is always greener, all that kind of stuff. The have and have nots, I think, is a better kind of uh, metaphor for it than mm-hmm. uh, grass is always greener. Because to be honest, down in the tunnels, it looks like it sucks. <laughs> there's, there's no, uh, it's a very, it's very clear which side's green, and everyone agrees that that side's green. Um, yeah. I thought it was an interesting way to tell that sort of movie, and how it doesn't shove it in your face, at least to me. Like it wasn't the whole time thinking, oh, he's trying to get a. Re- uh, across this point that there's just people that we're not familiar with and there, we always have this fear of them um, and it exists in many many ways in this current America and I think he even I read an interview with him about uh, his, that's why he put that line in when we first get to see Red uh, Red uh, Adelaide is her actor, the, the mm-hmm. character name um, where she says they're like who are you and she says we are American like he put that point very much to, to say that this is kind of how we currently are there are uh, people that you think are different than you, they're scared of, or you don't understand, and you're clicky, and you're in high school, and those guys are weird by the wearing right. mohawks and stuff. This is weird. So, no, I thought that was a great way to tell, a good way. He did a good job telling a story, and then having a, a message that he wanted to express, yeah. but not being too hard towards the message, forgetting that this is a movie and a story, right? So that's, like, one of my favorite parts. On top of, like, the shooting he's amazing visually how many oh mirror images? My gosh. yeah cinematography was absolutely beautiful um i want to point other people to movies like this when i grade cinematography um for instance you know there are several movies that are done really well and when you grade when you look at cinematography for a movie you know number one it it has cinematography has to do several jobs, right? It's got it's a it's a huge component of the movie. It's got several jobs it has to accomplish, and if it can't accomplish all of them, then it's not doing its job right. And this is like one of the perfect examples of top, I mean, like top tier, top quality, some of the best cinematography in TV and film today. You know, mm-hmm. um, it's easy when you have. You know, like like the movie Three Hundred has some of the best cinematography, quote unquote cinematography, but it's largely three D. It's largely green screened, right? So you can have any direction in any feel and any style you want. Man, that is so difficult when you have real people sitting across from you, and they're wearing colors, and you're in dark rooms, but you have a fire lit. But you know what I mean? Like this is seriously challenging work. You know, and he right. does fa- absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it's very true. I mean, I'm thinking, my fa- I think my favorite, there's two. Uh, and there's a lot of foreshadowing for the twist in this movie, and we'll get to it later. But whenever she's expressing her fear to her husband, uh, what's his name, the actor? Gabe. Uh, oh, Gabe. Was, uh, Winston. Winston. Duke. Duke Winston, right? Duke <clears throat> oh, I Winston. thought it was Winston something. I, I could be wrong. Was, it's Gabe Winston Wilson Duke. in the movie. Winston Duke. What a name. <laughs> what a name. Uh, Gabe. You're right. Gabe Wilson. Uh, no relation. Um, <laughs> so the the shot where she's expressing her fear at the house and it's like, I want to leave, I want to get out of here. And it's he chose to shoot it from behind. We don't even see her. We see just her reflection. As it's, And there's a lot of like, you know, the whole thing with Doppelganger is that she's scared of this person that looks exactly like her. And up into that movie, that's kind of all the message we get. But if you watch the trailers, you know it's more than that, right? Like, uh, I, this is one of those movies I think would be really interesting. And unfortunately, it's way too popular. It's making way too much money for you to get someone who has no idea what this movie is and watch it with them. That would be awesome. Yeah. Just zero knowledge going in to watch a movie 
like my parents maybe right, right. they might not <laughs> yeah. have any idea <laughs> but we get shots like that and that was a great choice and, and then whenever we get the conflict with red and adelaide and she shoves her face into the into the mm. table by the way we'll get into that table and some amazingness with the, t- the table of champions because there's just some lo- beats and logic with that table uh that i want to point out they're kind of funny but it's fine uh she's pressing her face into it and we get to see her own reflection right because it's on a, a table of glass and then we see red adelaide's face up there too see her reflection which all, all, they pulled off great because it looked awesome yeah they are the same actress i don't know how they did that was CGI. They had two cuts. It's like, you know, like that's what you're talking about. That's cinematography. That's how to be able to get that shot and pull it off as seamlessly as they did is a testament to how good the cinematography is. But that was like one of my favorite shots too. Um, when we see Gabe's character out swimming in the boat, right? That whole scene. <laughs> yeah. tense. That's so funny. Um, and, but the, the thing you were saying, it's dark. It's in dark or late, but mm-hmm. somehow we still we still have light to see everything. But it doesn't make it didn't to me. I wasn't like where the hell is that? It's just a, a lake with a drop light, you know, like yeah. just ran <laughs> around. Um, no, it was great. I agree. That that's one of the highlights of this movie. On top of the acting of uh, well, all the characters, but especially Lupita. And overall, I, I enjoyed the story and I enjoyed a lot of the, the choices were made. But. Yeah, this movie is awesome, and we can talk about it. And I, uh, I think we should just go ahead and get to the act structure so we can highlight some of the things we forgot to highlight on the way there. Let's do um, it. Three acts. So we open three acts. Set up. The first scene we get is in the 1980s. So, sorry. It starts off with one of those uh, black screens with context. Mm-hmm. Uh, exposition, if you will. Yeah, it's, it's knowledge drop that's important. For sure. Pretty much explaining that this country has a lot of tunnels and a lot of underground areas that aren't getting used and people don't know why they're used. And I think right up to that point, I'm like, well, clearly this is going to be important. And clearly, if you didn't say this, you might be at starting to ask questions uh, when we get later in the movie. But totally plausible to me, right? Like, I know we New York has unused subway stations that are just not being used now. Like, they're, they're broken or whatever. They decide not to use them. So all that is just a little setup. Then we move on to watching a commercial in the 80s about the Hands Across America, and I got on a real nostalgia trip because you and me grew up with the tail end of that. <laughs> yeah. Um, apparently, there was a lot of, like with a lot of charities, they ended up not giving the money to the actual people who needed it as much as they should have, right? Because um, it t- takes money to uh, start and run a charity. Uh, but I remembered that as a kid, and then it was just gone. Um, but I didn't remember what it was about, but in this commercial, this really creepy 90s commercial, which yeah. I guess all commercials were creepy in the 90s. I don't know. Like, I didn't think about well, it. if you're Jordan Peele, then, you know, yeah. And uh, I guess it was like a people would hold hands across America to to raise money for uh, the, the impoverished, the poor people, the, mm-hmm. the people who don't have homes, which I don't know how that accomplishes that. Um, are we passing cash down the line into the bank? Is that what? No, it's, it's like, uh, uh, what was that big one we just had recently where you dumped a bucket of water on your head? Oh, the ice, the ice bucket challenge. Ice, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't do anything, right? The whole point is just to raise awareness. So right. you create something <laughs> socially recognizable. You, you know, right? It's it's uh, essentially what it is, is it's branding. That's actually, yeah. that's, that's actually exactly what it is, is branding like you would a business. Yeah. So, hands across America. And I, I highlight it because it'll be important later. Otherwise, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have been in the movie and I wouldn't be talking about it. <laughs> uh, so, we get the context that this is young Adelaide watching this commercial. Then we cut to them at a relatively creepy uh, amusement park uh, in San, San Luis, right? No, it's in San, LA. Like it's, uh, Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz uh, in California. And so, her parents bickering having their little things dad's probably drinking a little too much mom's probably being a little too frustrated about the whole thing seems like everyone's having a good time except for them uh all the people around in the park are having a great time i didn't notice any other african-american families which i thought i'm not sure if that was a point that was to be made like do you just purposely make sure the extras were not of color i I just didn't notice it It was one thing i noticed and maybe i was paying too much attention what were you saying the the families weren't what the extras were not a nuclear family? No, I didn't see any uh, African-American families oh, really? in that. 
was a part. Okay. I just, I'm it trying to think back. Yeah. It wasn't looking, I but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that was the point. It, it really doesn't really play into anything. It's a, maybe it was just a choice. So maybe the only people that came that day for extra call outs were white. I don't know. We see later that there were, you know, in the movie, but anyway, I don't know if it matters. So we get to a point where the dad wants to play whack a mole and drunk mom goes to the restroom, leaving their seven year old daughter ish around there. Um, Old enough to know that she shouldn't be walking off on her own, but she goes ahead and does it anyway. And of course she does because why not? Um, she goes to a creepy, I think it was like a wizard's uh, tell your future type. It, that's yeah. kind of what it was advertised. But then we see at the Hall of Mirrors and then whatever. It's just a creepy little amusement park. Uh, but that night, there's a big thunderstorm. Uh, she goes to the beach to hang out there for a bit and then seeks refuge in this place. But she always, it seems like this is where she was going to go regardless. Uh, we get to, you know, Hall of Mirrors scene, which is always pretty fun. And then that, of course, sets up a shot of her doppelganger being behind her. And we get that shot of them being right there. And then only one turning around. Oh, shit. That's not a mirror. And then that turns around. And then the movie's off, right? Um, I don't even remember if we get a title sequence. I don't remember the title yeah. sequence, truth, to be honest. Um, and we cut to her. I believe we cut to her driving with her family on her trip. She's grown up. She's 30s. Uh, I believe that in this car ride, she has flashbacks of how she apparently got PTSD from this creepy doppelganger yeah. she saw when she was a kid. And her parents are like, she's messed up. What's wrong with her? Doctor's like, it happens. You should just encourage her to be creative. Maybe let her dance, let her draw. Maybe she can tell her story that way. Because she's not talking, apparently. Um, apparently, she had a really bad moment that caused trauma, and she's trying to get past it. So she's going with her, uh, her platonic family, Gabe. Uh, Adelaide, Zora, yeah. and Zora. Uh, Jake, Jason. Jason, yeah, Jason. Jason. <laughs> Normal name, and, how do we forget Jason? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, and they're kind of hanging out. It seems like a normal dorky family, right? They have their tropes. They're poking the brother, brother and sister poking the fun at each other. Uh, the son cussing a lot, the parents being real bad, and he says anus. And he's like, I'm actually was afraid of you cussing instead of saying anus. Um, but they was <laughs> they're going to a trip uh, to their lake house and they get there and it seems like it was her mom's lake house, but the mom's dead and it's the first time they come back. She's feeling all kind of nostalgic. We see that she's very, very protective of her son in in this setup in of the house, um, the lake house. One thing I noticed in particular, and it might be because maybe the, the son reminds her of herself a lot, how, and that's why she feels very protective of him in particular. The daughter, not so much, but the daughter seems, you know, Zora seems to have her shit together, yeah. in my opinion. Like, um, and Gabe is just kind of being a dad, uh, bought, a, bought a boat without asking anybody, and <laughs> we get a great daddy. scene. <laughs> yeah, crawl daddy. Uh, to we the get left. a great. <laughs> what I like about this movie too is. It curves to the left. It curves to the left, and the engine is a little wonky, and yeah. it has to be hit sometimes to get started. Both come up later in very important moments of this movie. There's a lot of little things, the little tidbit stories that tie back up. Yeah. As far as it, a lot of little bitty really foreshadowing, which you really enjoy as a movie watcher, you really like. Oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. I'm with you. Yeah. So I didn't, I didn't see the left turn coming, like that coming back into place. Right. Me neither. Um, I didn't see the engine. I kind of felt the engine might come back, but when I really noticed it was when the dude later we get when they go to the beach where the guys like, did you get a did you get a did you get a flare gun? Did you remember a flare gun? I was like, oh, that's gonna come back yeah. somehow. I don't know how, but anyways. So they hang out, hang out at the house. Everyone's having a good time. Uh, the son has a little parlor trick, a little magic trick that he can't get to working. He left it there the year before or however long ago it was, and. We get a little intro uh, side story in the car that I forgot that apparently their daughter doesn't want to run track anymore, but she's really good at running track. And they eventually find their way, glossing over some stuff, they eventually find their way back to the beach. Um, it is the San, Lu San Luis Beach, is that what you said? Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz. And that's important because that was the beach that she was at earlier, so she's a little freaking out. She's getting really anxious. In fact, her look and her feeling and her flashbacks for the scene, for someone who has suffers from anxiety, like I totally was feeling it. I was like, yeah, I get it. I get she's zonked out. She doesn't want to talk to anybody. She just really doesn't want to be there, but she wants to be there for her family, like, let, have, let them have a good time. Um, I, I really appreciate this part in the movie as far as 
the feelings it garnered for me and how I identify with her. Um, how, did you get any of that during that, that tense moment of her going to the beach? Uh, or is it just me because I have anxiety? I don't yeah. know. Um, I, I mean, I could certainly tell that she had it and I could certainly tell that she was braving it. Um, but from my perspective, uh, I was more with Gabe on Gabe's side as if like, I don't understand your fear. Your fear is unfounded for me, but I trust you. If that's the way you feel, then I hear you, but I don't know what you want me to do, you know, because I mean, ultimately at this point, she hasn't explained anything to Gabe. Gabe just is like, I don't know why you're, you know, and same, same with the, uh, the white chick, the lady, the friend, she's Mm -hmm. like, hello. Adelaide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Know. no, totally, and it's 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 a feeling hard to describe to others when it's happening to you. Yeah, and I I really appreciated that being in there because I was like, that's exactly how it is. You just don't want to talk. Like it almost feels physically that you can't talk. Like there's something in your body that's just like, no, we're not talking right now. Like <laughs> off, off, but um, but it's all it's all up here. Um. So I appreciate that part. We get to the beach. She's a little nervous. She she takes a look at the the the, the Merlin crazy horror shop that's still there because it was in '86 I was there, and in 2018 presumably, and it's still mm-hmm. alive, I guess. Uh, we get a scene of them meeting their family. So we get the um, the I forgot their names. Let's I'm gonna find out their names. The Tylers. So, I, All I know is the Tylers. That's fine. Let's go with the Tylers. We get the Tyler family. Uh, where it seems like the marriage is a little rocky, or at least they're having their tr- uh, their stereotypical frustrations with each other. <laughs> they have they have two twins who seem Are to be su- kind of jerks. Super annoying. They're super jerks. Like, yeah. but they like they really like cartwheels. That's the other thing oh, about them: cartwheels and, and they're jerks. Um, <laughs> and they that be- comes back later. <laughs> it does. And they seemed really like I'm trying to guess their age, but. From how fit they were, because we get to see them in the bathing suits that were at, they were very in shape. Like, yeah, I'm just, no stunt doubles for those cartwheels. Is all I'm saying. These these ladies could definitely execute cartwheels on their own, uh, completely. Yeah. Uh, so they they point out that uh, Jason's weird, and uh, Zora's like, "Hey, man, he's just you know he's he's got some stuff. You know, he's just, he takes him a while to warm up, right? Just calm down. He's not weird." And like I said, very much mom seeing herself and her son. Uh, why she's so protective of him. Yeah. So we're on the beach. Son, of course, goes off on his own, just like his mom, and goes to the restroom. Uh, we I forgot the scene. I already missed a little tidbit. When Adelaide went to the place, there was a dude that was holding a sign that said, Jeremiah 1111. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Okay. And you more, but I don't know if you know that passage at all off the top of your head. Not off the top of my head, but I actually have it right here in front of me. Go for it. Uh, it says, therefore, thus saith the Lord, behold, I am bringing disaster on them, which they will not be able to escape. And though they will cry out to me, I will not listen to them. There we go. Yeah, that's appropriate. <laughs> you wonder if, if, because 1111 comes up later in the movie, if he found the scripture first, or he liked the duality of 211. And was like, I need to find something with two eleven. And, yeah. And then found it. And it was like, holy shit, Jeremiah eleven eleven nailed it. This is the book <laughs> book passage. Anyways, he's holding the sign. On the drive back to the beach, we see the, the same gentleman, older, gets reeled into the ambulance and because he's murdered. And that's just one little tidbit to bring up. Uh the dad's like, Don't look, don't look. Like <laughs> it's a car, dude. Like I uh, I can see. Like you're not blocking the yeah. me. <laughs> So that's a little tidbit. So she he walks over there, sees sees the the particular funny house, the mirror house, but doesn't go in. But sees a dude just standing, t armed, with blood on his hands, just stripping. Right now, just me describing this to you, I now know what he was doing. <laughs> just at the time before, totally did not know what he was doing, and after the movie, totally forgot about him. But he's there waiting for some hands. That's what that guy's doing. He's there waiting for what? Waiting for some hands. To oh, I just now got that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that's what he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> so, and mom, uh, Adelaide knows that uh, Jason is gone and she freaks out and we see her being really, and then, uh, you know, Gabe's kind of like, oh, let's calm down. And 
the other folks, they were like, it's my clock somewhere. And they're like, what's re- what's he's fine. It's probably fine. Uh, Jason eventually walks back and he's like, hey, I'm fine. She's freaking out. Like, you know, like, oh my God, don't ever leave me. I'll protect you always. And you get to see that kind of mother, motherly protection uh, she specifically has for Jason. Um, and then they leave because mom's really distraught. We get a great scene from Zoro, like looking to see mom's gone and be like, good job freaking mom out, you ass. <laughs> it's just a quick <laughs> little line. I'm like, yep, brother, brother and sister relationship. I've been there before. Um, so they go home, and largely, the when we get the scenes when we're at home, um, we there's a couple that I want to highlight. Mainly, it's the motherly protection that she has over Jason. Uh, we learned that Jason is a very good artist who draws things super quickly because he draws the scene of the dude with the arm tees and the blood hands and himself watching over the shoulder. And I was like. Good job. I don't know when you did that, dude. Like, <laughs> you've been here for like a minute. I mean, it's um, not like top quality, but it's right for his age. So, yeah, you know, maybe it wouldn't take that long. But, yeah. But per- yeah, you knew what it was. Like, exactly. you knew, like, yeah. we didn't know exactly what he's trying to see. Yeah. Uh, and she's telling him, you know, stay with me and I'll always protect you. She sees the clock and it's 11 11. And super important for the theme of the movie overall, but also because she starts to see coincidences that she ends up making her freak out. And then we get the scene of, we get the great funny scene of Winston Duke and just the boxers and the, 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 <laughs> the sweater and just laying on the bed, spread his legs out. Yeah, yeah, on the bed that he basically takes up half of. The entire bed. He's a large <laughs> man. <laughs> he's a very big man. And he's just, he's, so he's, he's in the mood. He's, he's like, yeah, we're going to make some sweet love making. It was great fun. But that's another thing of this movie too. Um, maybe I should mention before is that there is good humor in this movie. That there really is. It doesn't really take away, doesn't take away from the overall tenseness or the horror of it, but it's still well placed. Um, there's one when you we got to talk about the kill count scene because that's one of my favorites. Yeah, I, I, I wonder did, mine too. <laughs> did you think about me when that was happened? Like well, I got the highest body count. <laughs> um, you got so, one. You got one. I, I had two. two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. She pretty much explains the trauma that she had when she was a kid the first time uh, Adelaide told the story to Gabe. And Gabe's like, oh, man, I didn't. Well, I'm sorry. And we get, you know, pretty much just telling her how she feels, how she she's always felt that that doppelganger is going to come back to get her. All these coincidences are happening. The dude with the Jeremiah sign. I don't even remember if he had it on him when he died. That would be kind of funny. It's like the aged cardboard aged just as much as he had while he yeah. was being real. <laughs> It wasn't that on the nose, but you, I, if you were, if you paid attention, you knew who that was. For sure. Um, and so she's freaking out. She's like, I don't feel good. I think we should leave. And Gabe's like, you need to calm down. I understand you're scared, but let's just chill for a bit. But before we can get a resolution for that conversation, Jason walks in, says, there's a family outside. And they're like, what the hell are you talking about? He's like, there's a family outside in the driveway. And like, what? <laughs> this idiot kid, whatever. Let's go see. Get a great shot of them all in red holding hands. We can't see their faces, yeah. and they're just standing there, super creepy. And it's in the trailers, right? It's a super creepy thing. So, mom, I've Adelaide, actually got it up on screen right now. You can't see it, but all you movie watchers can see it. It's not the yeah. exact same scene with them in the driveway, but it is a picture with all five, with all four of them holding hands. Um, so we get essentially all that happens is that the mom's super freaked out. Uh, we get a great line of just awesome horror logic for me where I don't, it's interesting. Maybe we could talk about it at the end, but she tells Zora, Zora, go put your shoes on. And I'm not sure if it's because everyone else had their shoes on or if Mama Adelaide knows more than we think and knew what was about to happen Yeah. and knew that Zora would need her shoes. I don't know. Foreshadowing maybe. Or maybe I'm thinking too much into it. But I did appreciate it just on that, the horror movie. I think it's thing. a great horror, like, it's just a great line to almost put in any horror movie. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because it's funny, but it's perfectly appropriate at the same time. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's just a perfectly well-placed line that I think almost goes in, like, every horror movie. So, yeah, yeah. it's kind of, I understand the foreshadowing. I understand that, you know, ultimately maybe she does know something. But it's kind of hard to say that, you know, you know that for sure. But which, I which you didn't say that, but you know what I mean? I'm just saying. Yeah. I appreciate it because 
that is one thing people don't think about. You need some shoes if shit's about to go crazy, right? So uh, Winston, sorry, Gabe, goes out there, tries to freak him out with his just talking shit. It's like, yeah, here, get off my property. I'm going to call the cops. <laughs> and that's what was great is they actually do the call of co- the cops immediately. But the yeah. mom, seeing the family, immediately calling the cops. Awesome, right? Like, if you're that freaked out, what's the worst that can happen, right? The cops come, nothing happens, they go away, and it's over, right? So, yes, call the cops. They did successfully call the cops. But apparently the cops in this area are very, very slow responders, and they just don't ever come. <laughs> it was like actually, over 14 out- minutes, I think. I thought I actually thought that 14 minutes was going to play a part, and I yeah. bet it would have. I bet the scene got cut. Maybe. Because I do not put Jordan Peele past, you know, put, put him past that. But if we can get into some foreshadowing ourselves, there's reasons why they probably did not end up coming. For sure. That we learn, learn later. Uh, so... He goes out there with a bat. They run at him. Uh, the big guy takes him out. Uh, or actually, they just come at him, and he goes back inside, tries to lock the door. Big dude starts banging on the door. The, the, the kids flank, like, in a military fashion. Just a quick, just go to the left and right. And immediately, like, the mom's like, they're coming around the sides. And, it, and Zora's like, I didn't lock my window. And so she yeah. runs over there, and the mom goes after her. Everyone's making some interesting, like, the choices so far make sense. Yeah. That all is happening right here. And... Uh, big, big daddy red. I don't know if he broke through the window. He grabbed the bat. Um, first, well, first off, he said there was a secret key. There was always a secret key. There was a great line where he's like, "Stupid white people <laughs> have the secret key," <laughs> and just the key under the rock. So they unlock the lock and he starts pushing on the door. The bat. He's holding it with his left. He takes the bat out and hits him in the knee. And I'm assuming he blew his knee out. Uh, it's the only way to explain. The limp of Gabe throughout the rest of the movie, uh, which is fine. If you hit someone with a bat in the knee, you're probably gonna mess them up. Uh, at least it's bruised and you can't walk. It's swollen, right? Uh, so Gabe's injured. Uh, they come in, and holy crap, are they creepy? Uh, Dad walks in, just menacing. The mom has like this weird. I can only turn in ninety degree angles when I'm walking, mm. like like a snake from Super that. Super creepy, game. yeah, but perfect. <laughs> That one apple game where you're the snake and you eat apples and your tail gets longer and you have, oh, like yeah. that's what it. Anyway, so they the all the people infiltrate and push them onto the couch, and they all sit on the couch and across from them is their doppelganger, and that's the scene that was set up in the trailers. Uh, we get the great scene, uh, the great line where everyone doesn't know what's going on, but then Jason's like, "They're us," and you see just mirror images of everyone. Um, one thing I want to point out: everyone's in the red jumpsuit. Everyone has one leather glove on their left hand. Might have been right hand. On one hand, have glove. Other, others did not. Okay, in this image, it is the right hand. Right hand. Don't remember which one Michael Jackson was. Yeah. Is it left? It might have been left because remember, she gets that thriller. So I, it's his missing glove. I don't know. (laughs) The weird (laughs) trippiness of this, like, oh well, I will take the right glove. That's gonna be our. Anyway, uh, and the mom had scissors. And she's just holding him the whole time. It's real creepy. And so this is maybe after she explains herself, or right, or right around the end of the first act. And I wanted to see if you, if you wanted to go into her speech right now, or if you wanted to highlight anything that I missed, or what you thought so far leading up to this point. Or oh, what your thoughts were? I'm digging the movie. I'm in the theaters. I'm like, this thing's dope. You know what I mean? I mean, first of all, okay. So from a writing perspective, you can already tell you know, if you're someone who pays attention to writing, that he's setting the story up for you. Like, this is ultimately what his job is, right? This is what the writing does in the first act. And you think he's laying lots of little nuggets around, right? And some are so good you don't even see them, which you don't find out till later. You know, like him holding it like the guy do the scarecrow thing. I thought he was just a creepy old dude. I didn't realize he was waiting to hold his hand. You know what I mean? Like, apparently, Jordan literally is just dropping everything that he can to let you know what's coming. Um, but you can kind of see that, and then uh, basically, I think from the first, you know, from the first scenes in the amusement park, you already know that cinematography is going to be fantastic. You know, he really understands lighting, which can make or break a movie. Which, um, from what I, from what I imagine and what I read, it's a lot tougher for uh, darker skinned yes, actors to have there. lighting for it. Mm-hmm. it. Doesn't seem bad. Like it doesn't seem just too bright or too shiny or too oily. Like it's, it's. You can imagine the different contrast in uh, skin tone being more difficult. Yeah. And it's, it's a dark room with 
people who have darker tone complexion, it's going to be tougher, but he nails it. Like even when, when we get to the point where her face is, their, their face is still hidden, but we can just see their eyes and he gets close enough for the light to actually show like, yeah, that's all them. Right. Yeah. Um, again, why I think it would be awesome to have someone watch this movie who does no idea what about this movie at all. Um, but yeah, no, I, I agree with you. Um, is there anything else before I get into the, no. the text? As of, as of this point in the movie, I am still I'm freaking loving it. So yeah, so we get introduced to the Red family. That's probably what I'm gonna call them: Red Adelaide, Red Gabe, Red Jason, and Red Zora. Um, Red Gabe apparently no one seems <sighs> to be able. To, yes, seems to be able to talk <laughs> except for Red Adelaide, who talks. Like she got punched in the throat at some point in her life, and that's been permanent damage. Like that's it's creepy. I don't know if there's any explanation to it. Um, but these people seem very unhinged. First off, one of them is a kid walking around like an animal with a mask on. No explanation. Zora has a permanent creepy smile on her face the entire time she's on screen. Uh, but Gabe's character just seems really confused, but like imposing. Yeah. But just and then. We have he seemed Red like Adelaide. a big dumb brute to me. That's yeah. like all he reminded me of. Red Adelaide drops her speech with her sword, and she's just, she's just like cross-legged on the chair, just like hanging there. It's a little creepy. Uh, but essentially what we get from her story, and I'm not going to try and recreate it because that'd be stupid. It was awesome. So how creepy and the delivery and the back and forth. Of the, this whole scene is awesome. It's It had to be super challenging to have, you know, essentially you acting to no one or at least you acting to what you thought was supposed to be yourself, yeah. and how dynamically different these people are from each other. Um, as much as they're supposed to be a doppelganger of their, themselves, they very much have their own personalities. So we get the, the, the exposition done. Uh, they call themselves the Tethered. They, she mentions that they lived underground for long enough. They've lived like crap. You guys have been getting all the good stuff. It's, sort, it's time for us to take over. Um, they, he's, we get a little information dump that they found a way to copy the body, but not the soul. And so they share a soul, and that's why they, that's why she she married and had kids with the, the doppelganger of Gabe, because there is this connection between them, even though they have been living underground and eating rabbits. I already forgot the scene in the opening of the scene that was the title screen was The Wall of Rabbits. With no context, it was just a zoom out of this wall of rabbits. But anyway, that was creepy too. Um, and so the idea is that they, she's been wanting to get a life. She wants to take a, a regular Adelaide life. Uh, Red is like, this is what's happening, and the only way we can do it is if we we eliminate our tethered. And so we get. She has weird signals for each one that's different. Um, to go take out their counterpart, right? So I think first was the dad. The dad's the first one that gets taken out, right? Mm -hmm. If I remember correctly. So Gabe gets dragged by uh, Red Gabe. I totally thought he was going to die right here. <laughs> yeah. And the dude, as, as big as Winston Duke is, it's still crazy to me that Red Gabe just grabbed him by an ankle and was just dragging. <laughs> just easily dragging yeah. him through into, into the back towards the pier. That happened. And this is after, you know, she's meant she did some signal for him. We get a scene where, like, he touches his eye and then the doppelganger touches his eye, too. You, you have a thing. You, you imagine, because Winston uh, Gabe wears glasses the entire movie, that the other Red Gabe has really bad eyes, too. And so, like, that's why he puts the glasses on. He's like, what the hell? Um, she, tells, she tells Jason to go play with, uh, I think that they actually do have names. But I'm going to call him Red Jason. I forgot. I think they do have names. Uh, canonically, I don't know if we ever hear them, but anyways, so they go to play, but the mom's like, show them your tricks, because earlier in the movie, the, the, the back closet with all the tricks uh, can only be open from one side, and he always gets stuck in there, and so the mom's just like, got you, go trap him in that freaking thing, and right when she said that, I was like, oh, okay, that's what's happening. Um, again, plot points, little things he sets up for later, and then she tells the, the red Adelaide tells Zora to run, is all she says. And Zora's just, and mom's like, yeah, run. <laughs> um, and I forgot beyond this is that red Adelaide tells the mom, Adelaide, to handcuff herself to the table. And it's a very interesting set of cuffs 
when I, I saw it. It was like a golden I chain. So. I thought so too. I was like, there's something going on here with these cuffs. <laughs> and so that's the setup. Everyone's going to try and kill their other counterparts. They're all different scenarios and different ways of handling and different personalities, which I appreciated. And then we get uh, Adelaide just, this, again, Adelaide just like, wait, like you know, mm-hmm. being super creepy. And I want to shout out to this table. This table apparently can keep her grounded there, right? Like it's a coffee table. Mm-hmm. If she wanted to lift that thing up and toss it around, she probably could. In fact, if she was real smart and yeah. the other red Adelaide was real stupid, she would have put it on the bottom rung so she could uh, lift it up and then walk away. On the leg, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but she does actually – she does put it to, to where that isn't possible, mm-hmm. right? So fine. Uh, it takes the course of her head later and doesn't bend. It just They made it seem like it, this thing was immovable to me, and the whole right. time I'm like – she could probably get out of that. Yeah, the coffee table. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Um, but anyways, so we get a sh- we get a shot. We'll first talk about real quick about um, the battle of the boat, where Red Gabe and Red Gabe uh, are fighting in the boat. Um, <laughs> that's where we get the, the it, it means to the left thing because uh, they have a they have a he actually puts them in like in a bag, right? Mm-hmm. In like just a, a bag, and he pokes his eyes out. And <laughs> plays, he plays he plays possum. Yeah. And he comes back, gets the bat, hits him in the face, because the, the engine died again, right? That's the setup from earlier in the movie. The engine died. And the best part is in the earlier in the movie, the engine died, he did a few times, and then it surprised him and went on, and he had to scare him, and he had to go run and you know, get the boat back. Same thing happens again. The engine died, hits a few times. He's already hit Red Gabe in the face with a bat. He probably should be dead, if I'm honest. Because you probably drowned in the after. It's that. an aluminum bat. Like, <laughs> your head's caved in. Yeah. <laughs> Gabe's then, huge. He's a huge person. If he yeah. hits you with half a swing. Which I guess guy, at that point, maybe maybe it is because he can't put fully support himself on that knee, but still. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Let's. You're, all right. That, that's, <laughs> that's good enough, I guess. Let's go with that. He couldn't step but into you, the swing. All right, okay. You, I'm with you. But, <laughs> but you still probably are drowning because of being confused and breathing in water, right? Yeah. But whatever. Um, and can they swim? Uh, yeah, they've probably never experienced water. <laughs> um, so, no. I'm going to say they can't. <laughs> and we, But there's a key point where when he falls over, he, his foot gets caught in this life preserver line. And that's one thing that comes important. So he falls. Uh, the life preserver doing its thing, preserving his life, I guess, but he's still at the very bottom of the underwater. And the, then the engine turns on, and of course Gabe just gets thrown out of the fucking <laughs> boat. And and it's like, oh God, I can't believe it. It was a real funny moment. And so try to swim back to land, and then we see the boat just start coming around because it always turns to the left, and it's just making a circle again. And the whole time I'm like, this is great. I was like, would I get back on the boat? I don't know if I get back on the boat. I don't know. Maybe I'll just keep running. Like, I don't want to get back to the boat. Because what happens when you get back to the boat? Of course, he comes back. The the red gig. Because the life preserver, he just kind of hops on there. And we get a great scene where, he, I guess he has some shears on him. Uh, those awesome uh, scissors. Tries to kill Gabe, stabbing an eye. We get that moment. They're like, just rustling over the thing. Yeah. And Gabe does the, one of the best things ever. <laughs> just <laughs> hit butt the engine to get it started. And that's when the blades tear up Red Gabe, just like that propeller, just yeah. eats him alive. <laughs> and, you know, and he's done. So, like, good job, Gabe. Gabe gets one. That's so funny. We follow uh, uh, Zora. She runs away from her, doing her track thing. Uh, so it's creepy. We have a creepy scene with the car, but the key important thing is that, uh, like I said, foreshadowing before, she had to run away, and that's why her, her having shoes is good. Uh, the only reason she gets away skate three um, is because some neighbor comes in because Red Zora's on the car and he's like, get out of my car. And then I was like, that guy's dead. And then Zora takes that <laughs> and run, run back to the to the house. And of course, Red Zora kills that dude. Uh, Red Jason traps other Jason in the closet eventually, but we get a weird thing where Red Jason always likes to mimic Jason. Like whatever he does, Red Jason does. So he puts his mask down. Uh, Jason always has a mask, kind of his thing. And so when he rips the mask off, you see that Jason, Red Jason, rips his mask off, and he's been—he's a burn victim, essentially. Like there was a fire somewhere down 
I mean, they, they, they drop that line later. But that's a key point is that he kind of likes to mirror his doppelganger. Jason gets out of there. Uh, well, he finally gets the trick to work. Just flashes and that distracts her Jason enough. He locks him in the, in the closet. And we get, uh, go back to Adelaide and her doppelganger having their talk, um, being super creepy and like, um, I think we don't really get this at this point. She's asking why. And besides the overall, just like, well, you guys, we're, we've been impoverished and we've been lying and take over. We don't really get too much information here before Jade comes back. And, uh, sorry, before, <laughs> uh, red Jason freaks out in the closet and then Adelaide's like, that one's yours. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is a key line. Like, yeah, it's yours. And uh, Jason, Jason's hiding. In that point, Lupita Trent gets out by getting a fire poker. Um, that's her weapon for the rest of this movie. And pries open the wood to get off. And then this is another key question I love about horror movies. So you have a cup, and the other cup was tied to the um, to the table. What do you do? Do you, you get the cup and use it as brass knuckles? Like, is that what you're doing with it? Uh, do you cup it to the same wrist? That way you just have a little annoying chain that you don't have to worry about holding it. But there's no poten- there's no potential for you to get cuffed again. Um, what do you do? That's pretty clever. I actually never thought of that. You do that one. Cuff it to the <laughs> but same wrist. The, but it saves your life later when she gets handcuffed to use the chain to block some stuff. That's the only point. You end up yeah, being good later. But you can't foreshadow that. So you have to make the best decision you can in the moment. And the best decision you can in the moment is not to cuff both hands. Yes. Right. Well, she yeah, she doesn't. She 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 just holds it. Like I was like, with, I don't even know if it's brass knucks, but she just holds it, um, in her in her hand. But like I said, to prevent being handcuffed later in the future, you handcuff the same wrist, and you just have this weird bracelet. Right. And it's like a chain, and that's all, that's all you got. You can maybe hit people with it or choke them. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but anyways, she gets out. She gets Jason. Uh, they. That's when that Papa Papa, um, Wilson. Haunts the horn of the stupid Gabe, boat. Yeah, Gabe right, Wilson. That's right around where Zora comes back, and they all get on the boat. And they peel away, and we see Mama Adelaide, or Red Adelaide, and Red Jason just watching them. I'm like, oh, it's just like, oh, we're going to get you. So they go to their friends with Tyler's house. We get a great scene of Tyler, the Tyler family, and of course, the dad who's just drinking on the table. Uh, that's all he's doing. Uh, the mom. <laughs> The mom's like, I heard, I heard something outside. Go check outside. And he's like, but I'm doing something. <laughs> Which is just sitting there drinking a whiskey. That's, that's all. Yeah. Presumably. Um, just a funny little scene. You can tell they're bickering. He's like, you just get out there. And he messes with her. And, but it turns out there are people out there. But before we get to see them out there, they do have this interesting uh, uh, Alexa-adjacent technology called... Odessa or no, Ophelia? No, it's Ophelia. Yeah. Yeah. And he's like, Ophelia, play Beach Boys. And he's playing some Beach Boys song. And they were still fighting and bickering. And he's like, there's nothing out there. But the, the, the backup generator had happened. Like, it did kick in. Um, that was a conversation that the two dads had on the beach because, you know, Gabe finally got a boat and he drops down the line, hey, did you, did you remember to get a flare gun? He's like, no, I didn't get a flare gun. And it ends up coming back later. It's why i'm mentioning it again um so they're having their arguments the daughters come out of their their rooms are like we know you we can hear you like like go to bed it's fine the generator it's like no we heard you fighting like you know it's just like a key like a little family moment that i appreciated like very honest then we get a zoom out from the house and then we see the red doppelgangers of the tyler family just fucking murder them all with my favorite part of the whole movie (laughs) (laughs) um so much fun yeah, just all the next. So the two daughters are done completely immediately. The dad's done. The only one who survived her cut was the mom. Yeah. And then we see the creepy doppelganger versions of the Tyler family who are very different from the doppelganger versions of the 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 Wilson family. Yeah. And I gotta say, at first in the theater watching this, I had problems with the inconsistency here. I think he. I think it's explained okay. I'm not going to say it's explained well, but I think it's okay. So yeah. first watching this, I'm like, uh, these are not the same. You know, mm-hmm. I'm like vastly different actually. But I yeah. understand it's good enough. Right. I, I appreciate 
the red Papa Tyler personality. Like he has a very unique quirky yeah. personality yeah. Um, that I thought was creepy and awesome. The the mom has her own personality as well. Um, Mama Red, Mama Red Tyler. Um, but anyways, we get a scene where uh, actual uh, Mama Tyler is still alive, trying to crawl to her husband. And she looks at Ophelia, who has blood splashed on it, which I don't know if there's any context to this imagery that the technology has blood on it. But she does the awesome thing. Does Ophelia call the police? And I don't even know if Alexis can do that. They probably can. I don't know. I don't have one. But Maybe. I do have um, one, but I did not use it because I do not like her. <laughs> uh, and Ophelia's like, uh, play Fuck the Police by N.W.A. Yeah. And, then, <laughs> and that's the song that's playing now. Uh, and that's she gets stabbed again, like just straight up right across the throat to fully kill her. And everyone's blood and there's blood everywhere. Um, and the reason why I say this is the, the song is ruined for me now because it's the following scene, which is pretty rad. The, the Wilson family make it to the Tyler family's house, but see shit's wrong. And they yeah. see people are dead. And so the mom goes up first if I remember correctly, and the kids and the dad who's limping using the, the, the bat as a cane um, are just hanging out back, just wait, making sure things are okay. So she goes to the doorbell and Red Tyler with a creepy ass smile and slip back hair just staring at her with like the coat he just put on, the little uh, bathrobe, and Mama, the, Mama, or sorry, Adelaide knows exactly what's going on because she hits him right in the face with that fire hook. Yeah. And it gets embedded in his skull but I guess it's not that it's not that thick, and maybe she didn't go that deep. But he doesn't seem to be bothered by it. Yeah. But she does rip it. She does get it back, like eventually. Um, so he's like, "Bitch, please!" and just like pushes her off. And then we get this awesome scene of all three of the women grabbing Adelaide and just ripping her in the door, yeah. like from the side. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have the slow walk of uh, Papa Red um, Tyler just walking down, just being real creepy and freaky, and you know. Gabe's like, oh shit, here we go. <laughs> All right, and so he's just like, he's just—it's such a slow horror thing. I know it's so interesting. <laughs> he's he's using the bat as a cane to kind of go back to the boat, and the kids run off, and we get a great scene. And I guess I'll I'll culminate the the boat fight, boat fight two, round two. It's uh, Red Tyler versus Red Papa Tyler versus Gabe. And this is where I remember. This is where I was like, there. Yep, there's the you see the 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 really crappy Wilson boat and the awesome Tyler boat. It's yeah. like biatch, please, with yacht. It <laughs> yeah, felt like, like a yacht. Well, I think it's like biatchin. I think it's biatch, please. But either way, oh, okay, they, they, right. put, it matter, yeah. they, they put the yacht in bitch. Yeah. And but yacht spelled like the boat y a c h t. Like it was very Maybe that's what it was. very very clever. Um. And I'm like, he's going to get that flare gun. Here it comes. And so, of course, he goes to the boat, lies down. And, you know, Red Papa Tyler is doing his freaky thing, take, just eating this moment up. He's about to kill this guy. And we see Gabe in there with the flare gun. I'm like, <laughs> oh, man, you could probably mess someone up with a flare gun. Probably. I was like, it's possible. I don't know, yeah. The ones in the movies, at least, I've seen have a lot of enough. Like, there's this, yeah. this is a weapon that's been used before. And he shoots it. And it just is like, I don't know if it was either flare guns aren't that powerful or this one just hasn't been kept up, but it's just like, and like, it just falls down. And oh, it's no, still, like, it like bings around, I think. Doesn't it? Yeah. It, yeah. It, but it I does thought not he just miss. I thought he just like misses him. And then it's like, ding, ding, ding. And then it just hits the ground. I think it might've been an old flare oh. and it just did not have enough. And of course, who knows how well those things aim in general, but it was just hilarious. And then they have their fight, and we get a great scene of them just tussling in the boat with the red light, and we don't know what happened. Uh, but then we get that best scene, and this is the reason why NWA will never be the same for me. We get the Zora and Zach, Jason, sorry, Zora and Jason walk in, they grab weapons, and they're ready to go. What do we got? Zora has got the most in strongest, durable putter I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> <laughs> this thing goes through a lot and it is still coming. Like if, it never if it been. was a weapon in the division two, which is what we're playing right now, it would be called the skull breaker or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause it, it, I, I, it, it, but it has to be a replica putter because there's no way it's made out of what normal metals were putter is supposed to be made out right. of. Cause that's not great. And then the more plausible weapon is just a large knickknack rock thing that Jason takes, mm. which is, 
you know that thing's got some heft to it. And they are there for the sole mission of saving their mom. <laughs> so we get a great scene of them seeing all the dead bodies of everyone. NWA is still playing in the background. They go upstairs. And we see the freaking uh, the sister, uh, Tyler's sister, just doing freaking cartwheels and handstands off in the distance. Because yeah. <laughs> apparently they really like gymnastics. And she sees them and runs at him. And that's when Zora's just like, bitch, and just hits her in the face. And I was like, damn. <laughs> Boom. And she hits her and she falls off the second story into the, another coffee table. And she's done. Right? She's down for the count. They don't know where the other one is. So they start inching around. They go into the bathroom. And we get a great scene of the one just doing a handstand in the, in the back closet. Yeah. And, and then she just freaks him out by dropping down just screaming at him. <laughs> and I think she has, does she have shears? Does this one have shears? I forgot. If she had shoes, but anyways, this is more of a tussle. Uh, Josh is, or sorry, Jason's probably not really helping at this moment in time. He's just kind of hanging out there. But Zora's got it. She clocks her with a putter, and it just goes to town on her face. Oh my god! Ah, yeah. ah, it's going blood everywhere. Jason's like, "Wow!" Go, <laughs> uh, I'm a little freaked out. And again, putter still in mint condition, not bent, still going strong. <laughs> they go. We get a great scene of uh, Mama Tyler, who is handcuffed, uh, Adelaide to uh, to the bed. Like I said, if you had double handcuffed your wrist, this wouldn't have happened. But whatever. So she's officially handcuffed again for the second time, and <laughs> she's putting on makeup. Uh, red Tyler, uh, red Tyler, Mama Tyler, and it's pretty interesting scene. Like I'm like, okay, like you can tell she's wanting to hang out. So she goes to watch uh, her husband. I guess. I don't know if there's marriage in the underground. Uh, killed Gabe, and she's all like, yeah. And that's when Zora tries to walk in. Be real quiet. And he's like, I'm going to get my third right here. Here we go. I'm about <laughs> to get out Tyler. But Mama Tyler sees the reflection. Again, reflection in the movie. So she's there. And she, she, you know, counters, puts her on the bed, and is trying to put shears in her eye, right? And she's totally about to kill Zora. And then Mama Adelaide, great scene of, like, the tension of her wanting to protect her children. She's yeah. trying to think to like get she's her body. Really trying. Yeah. That yeah. was legit, legit acting. I thought, but she's useless, right? There's nothing she can do. Yeah. But she, and then when we remember, all right, in the hole, Jason with that large rock thing, just crushes her skull. <laughs> so Jason's got a kill. Zora's got two kills. Uh, and De uh, you know, Gabe, we find out does survive. He has two kills. He killed uh, Papa Tyler in, the, in there. So we get a great scene of them just being like, wow, <sighs> shit's crazy, right? And just the dead bodies are just hanging out. And they're like, I, they try to call the police, but they're on hold and never, there's no answers. And we're like, what's going on? Why can't we get anyone? Why do they have doppelgangers? I thought it was just us. What the hell's going on here? Yeah. So they turn on the TV. We My find out. My favorite scene in the whole movie. <laughs> that, that, they are been stabbings for cheers all across America, and people don't know what's going on. But we put it together as viewers that everyone on this in this country has a doppelganger. Yeah, and we see them holding hands, which is a little bit weird. And if you remember the hands across America thing, you're like, okay, this one makes sense. Uh, but everyone's getting stabbed, and no one knows what's going on. But it makes sense why the cops can't help them, and it makes sense why they didn't help them to begin with uh, at their house. It's all shit has gone down. So we went from a uh inv in a house invasion horror movie to a full-on invasion in horror movie this is worldwide or at least america wide and adelaide's like we need to get to mexico yeah yeah we need to leave dave's like it'll be fine it'll blow over we, we just we just we're fine we're in a safe house with a bunch of glass wind doors right we'll be safe and he's that's not no you're not gonna be safe like they, they yeah. can get it they showing themselves resort. So they can't. Again, I do appreciate this. Uh, they decide to leave. And they're like, wait, who has the keys? Of course, they, it's not their car. They're going to steal the Tyler's car, which is like the awesome is it navigator. It's a, it's a legit SUV. I forgot what it was. Um, they don't have the keys. So, again, in the moment that I would feel really creeped out at those as well, uh, the mom's like, oh, fuck, I go back in. You know, like, here we yeah. go. Something's gonna happen, and it, I guess it's just the fob, right? That uh -huh. There's no anything tied to this keychain. She finds it it's on the kitchen table. She's about to go out there, but then she notices coffee table sister not there anymore. What the hell happened? 
That's from coffee table sister. She's the one that has shears. She comes after mom uh, after Adelaide. They have a tussle. And I think Jason's the one that walks back in. And we see that Adelaide is just going animalistic on this yeah. daughter, just like stabbing her. But I, forget, I think she gets the shears from her and just stabs her on the ground just like 18 times. It's like, ah, and she gets, let's go to a war. And Jason's just like. He goes patriot on her. Yeah. She, sorry, she goes patriot on her. And Jason's a little freaked out, but this night's been crazy. So let's keep going. She grabs the keys to get in the car. But Zora's like, I'm driving. And she's like, you're not driving. You don't even know how to drive. She's like, no, I have the highest kill count. I'm driving. <laughs> and then the dad's like, well, pff, so I have, I have two. I have two. So I have my two and you're at two. And I say that mom drives. And she's like, and the mom's like, I actually just killed the, <laughs> the yeah. coffee table chick. I have two. You need to get in the back. And before, <laughs> <laughs> before they can like figure that stuff out, they see one of the, the reds Zora. coming down. Yeah. So she hops in the back. And Zora's driving while Red Zora's right there in the hallway. And so Dad's like, sit in reverse, we're gonna get out of here. And Zora's like, ah, put that in the car. The rotate shifter in cars? Yeah. I don't like it. But whatever. Well, if you remember earlier, Gabe, like back before this scene, Gabe talks about them buying the car just to make him mad, just to get under his skin. Yeah. So essentially what I think Jordan's trying to do here is show that these people are essentially just spending a lot of money on their toys. You right. Know I mean, because the whole key fob, not a key thing. Nowadays, we essentially have push start, which is so irritating because we just got my wife a new car and it is keyless push start. And in fact, when you change the gears in it, you just push little buttons. Oh. I'm like, who, who designed this? This is so dumb. I have a push start, but I have a gear shift yeah. on the console. And that's so we use Yeah. Uh, it's, more, it's not the side one that's on the wheel, it's on the console, and it's just yeah. up and down, right? So I, I appreciate that. But I will say, you might be hating keyless entry, but it is really cool to walk uh, up to your car. Keyless entry. Keyless entry is cool. Yeah. And just open the door and walk in. Yeah. Like, it just unlocks for you because it senses how close you are. Right. The bummer of that is it doesn't unlock my passenger door, so I always have to remember if someone's riding with me, they have to unlock their door. <laughs> it's just, it doesn't do it. Like, I figure, but the, but the funny part is if I open the door from the passenger side, it will unlock, because it, it senses me. But uh, when I open my, my driver door, sits down, doesn't automatically open the passenger side door. Good. Minor annoyance for what I hope comes into a horror movie where that is actually good that it's still locked. Yeah. On the side. They, should, they should write that in, that would be good. That'd be cool. People like you anyway. would get it. People like me would believe it. Ah, either century. Now I get it. Um, so she drives straight into to Zora. Zora, athletic as hell, just oh, runs up the car. Acrobat. Yeah. <laughs> we get a great scene of, over here. We get a great scene of them like wondering where the hell she went, and then the uh, dad opens the, the sunroof, and then Zora's like stabbing through the sunroof. Red Zora, and then uh, she hits the brake. I think at this point, Red Zora stabs, or I don't know if she hits the brake or she hits the gas. I can't remember. I think she hits the gas. Anyway, she ends up on the hood and she starts breaking through the, trying to stab through the windshield. And this is when Zora gets what I was like thinking the whole time. I'm like, speed up, hit the brakes, and watch her fly. Yeah. It's about to happen. And of course, she ends up eventually doing that. And she flies. She goes into the woods. And for whatever reason, we can debate whether it's a, a you, you're supposed to confirm a kill or not. Mom's like, well, I gotta go make sure she's dead. And it's probably foreshadowing for what we learn about that character that she may, well, needs to make sure that this person is dead. But I remember in the moment, I'm like, we do not have time for this. <laughs> we need to leave. But sure enough, Zora's impaled on a tree, essentially. Uh, she, it's so dark, and she's definitely dead, but she's just bent backwards on a tree. Just, she's like wrapped around <laughs> it. Yeah, <laughs> She's gone. And we get an interesting thing where Adelaide kind of looks, seems like she has some remorse for yeah. the death of this one. Um, interesting after we after all the things have been revealed for us, but it's an interesting scene that's thrown in there. Anyways, they drive back to San San Luis. San what's the name of the beach again? Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz. I'm going still forgotten this, this entire time. They drive to Santa Cruz Beach for some reason. Shit is at the fan. There's dead bodies everywhere. Fire in the car. It's it's like it's dystopia so fast, so quickly, right? And it makes sense that there's 
for every 7 billion people uh, in America, it's like 200, 300 million, but no, for every we're, American, we're up over 350 million now. So for every American, there's a doppelganger that's killing people right now. So it makes sense that there's just a bunch of dead bodies. Mm-hmm. And we see a car. Um, I'm trying to remember when the second act ends. Like, yeah, no, we're still going. Uh, we see a car that's on fire, and immediately Jason's like, "It's trapped." I know that. I know that that's our. If it turns out that it's their SUV, their shitty uh, station wagon. <laughs> station thing. wagon. Yeah. <clears throat> it's set on fire, and then we see uh, Red Jason walk out and just start doing this with the, the trick with the thing. And he just no, he's snapping. That's what he's doing. Right. He's just snapping. And Jason and the mom goes out and starts kind of walking out there to be like, "You want to go right now? Well, I'll take you out, Red, Red Jason. We're about to have have town. I still got my fire poker. It's still good." And that's when Jason makes a great conclusion. It's a trap, which I love. That he was just immediately like, mm-hmm. "It's a trap." And then what I also appreciate is everyone else was like, "We believe you. We need to get away from the car." <laughs> course, they run away from the car. That's when Adelaide looks back. And then she sees that trail of gasoline because the kid had been underneath the car. I remember now they had pulled into the road, saw the car on fire and then backed up. And then the kid got out from under the car. Yeah. So at some point he got under the car to hit the gas line. Anyways, he's about to light the match. Like he just spins a match out with the gloved hand and he's about to light it. And that's the thing in this movie. He's been lighting matches. And that's it. There's a key detail. He likes to light matches. Apparently yeah, he he's likes the pyro. pyro. Yeah. He's a bit of a pyro because he got burned alive. Makes sense. Um, but Jason does this thing where he does the mirror thing again, pisses out, hands out to the side, and just starts walking backwards. And the red Jason copies him and then walks himself into the fire. And it's a great shot, great scene of just multiple angles of seeing that he's just making him kill himself in the fire. <laughs> and it's like, well, good job, Jason. That was pretty smart. Except <laughs> next to the appropriately red suburban. Is Red Adelaide. The conveniently located. <laughs> <laughs> just hanging out by the car. Yeah. And right with Jason. I knew this she, whole time. <laughs> Red Jason, she pops into action and just takes him and takes him down. And then Adelaide's like, oh man, we got to go. And that kind of starts to set off that part. Um, real quick, all that happens with Gabe and Zora is that they see that there's people with their hands, holding hands, all the Red Jackets holding their hands. And they're like, this is real creepy. Uh, but we're going to hang out by the hand and that's what we're going to do. <laughs> I, love do what, like, I love what Gabe says right here. Uh, I can't remember what the exact words were, but he's like, it looks like some effed up, oh, what is that, like mob? Like, what is those dancing flash mob? mob? Flash mob. Flash. Yeah, it looks like some effed up flash <laughs> mob. <laughs> <laughs> great, yeah, it's a great line. Uh, and so that's what they do for the rest of the movie. The key point is probably... And I know you don't like the end of this movie, but the sequence that follows from her going back down to the underground, uh, and convenient point is that she knows where she's going. Um, maybe you should pay attention to that. We get a little more flashbacks, I think, during this this point. We will get a little more context of that, yeah. the event that shaped Adelaide's childhood, but not too much. But the scene of the, the escalator going down, uh, so it turns out, that Hall of Mirrors has an escape door that leads to an esca- running escalator that goes down to the underground into a tunnel. Remember, I mentioned that at the beginning. Um, and it's so tense. And she's walking and she's going into this underground thing and she opens it to what is essentially the, the tethered um, home with this weird white uh, tiled, just weird underground facility. And each room has a bunch of desks and a bunch of cages for rabbits. And that's one thing you notice when you walk in here is that there's a ton of rabbits just hanging out because apparently they left the cages. Is that imagery for what happened to them as well? Probably. Um, but she's just walking around with her cane or with her fire poker, just trying to figure out where they all are. And the whole time the audience is us, we're like, what the hell is going on here? Like, the, I remember thinking like, well, it's probably clones because they cloned rabbits and that seems like a cool idea. And she. So the only context we get was from Red Adelaide saying they figured out a way to copy the body um, and that they use them to control the people above because their, their souls are tied to each other. Like, that's kind of the context we get, but it's explained by a person who's clearly insane. So yeah. who knows <laughs> who knows how we can tie this together? If we can believe her, right? Uh, so she walks around, super tense, super great acting from Lupita on both sides of this, and she finds... 
she finds red Adelaide by a chalkboard with it has people uh, the the hands across America signified uh, on the chalkboard and she's cutting something. And I forgot when I know, knew what she was going to do when she was cutting. Like, I was like, is that Jason? Like, I have no idea. Once the red paper started to fall on the floor. Yeah. They, they would literally, that would, they would make that like its own scene. Yeah. You know, so I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so this is where, like, Adelaide's confronting her doppelganger. And we get some good back and forth. Where she's just, like, expressing how unfair her living situation was compared to Adelaide. And... She asks a great line. She wonders what would have happened if you had taken me with you. Right? Because we remember that meeting where they saw each other. Uh, spoilers, that was her. I don't know if that, I yeah. revealed that. <laughs> if you um, haven't gotten that by now, like, I don't know. Yeah. You can't help it. Instead, instead of splitting off, if they had both went upstairs. Right? She didn't. And it, it, it gives an interesting dynamic here because up until this point, we've always thought, or at least for me, the doppelgangers were bad people. But then when you start learning the context of how horrible this place is that they've lived in and how they've only eaten rabbits probably for their entire lives, it's like they don't seem necessarily like the bad guys, but then they also murder a bunch of people. So still kind of bad yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's it's kind of like the us versus them mentality are they really that bad are they really that different from us if we were transported down and lived in the sewers and lived off rabbits would not be just as messed up as these people are and do they have a right to feel just slighted against as well yeah they do like but they are still murderers and my favorite because is blue so i don't i wouldn't have been with a jumpsuit but that's just me yeah. <laughs> so we get to the, she turns out the paper she's cutting is like that's that thing where you cut out uh where people are holding hands again imagery again and she unfolds them and she has a great scene where it's just she cuts off two of them and it's just them because like her family's dead <laughs> is what i got from that and then has them too and she rips them apart kind of like okay this is the this, this final battle and so we get but the theme song for this movie has been in the trailers. If you remember it, it plays in this final battle scene. God, it was such a good song. Like, to tie it to this is, moment. Yeah. It was a fantastic score for this moment, for the scene. And we get flashbacks of <clears throat> both Adelaide dancing. Uh, being, uh, uh, not, what is that kind of dancing called? Ballet. So we see above ground Adelaide totally being awesome and totally majestic and being ballet. And then we see that um, Red Adelaide is also being a ballet, but it's real weird and real animalistic. And it's it's two contrasts that we're seeing. Yeah. During that, we get a fight between these people where uh, Red Adelaide does her loose, her right angle freaking walking. That's super creepy. Yeah. And she is the one that's in control of her emotions. And she is the one that seems to be dancing more fluidly while Adelaide is going straight animal right now and just trying to hit her as many times as she can, but she yeah. keeps missing. Going crazy. Adelaide just does a little spin and slashes, essentially just like someone who knows bo like boxers, someone who's completely floating like a butterfly, and the other person that's just being closing their eyes and just reeling windmills yeah. at that person. And it was really interesting that we get the, the flashbacks with the dancing, Merit having the similar... Um, having a similar dynamic difference between each other and those people fighting in this battle. And she gets slashed, you know, Adelaide gets really messed up. She gets stabbed a couple times. I think they're most slashes and not too much punctures, but we all end up in a bunk where they sleep. And I think this is the one moment where Adelaide kind of calms down and figures her shit out. And that's when uh, Red Adelaide comes from behind her and she turns and just impales her mm -hmm. with, the fire poker, which, how much force do you think that'd take? It's, oh, heck of a lot. I mean, to break the skin, nothing, right? right? To get past muscle tissue and bone to kill someone? Yeah, <laughs> a lot. It goes yes, through. A lot, it a goes, lot. One, it goes through clean all the way through her. And this is the scene where 
this whole time, it seems like Adelaide's been more animalistic, and she's continued that up until this point, where she almost seems like a dominant predator overtaking her, her quarry, her prey, and kind of like expressing her dominance of the area. Uh, and we see, at this point, Jason hops out of the... He, he hid in the closet or a locker, and I don't know if that's where Red put him or if that's where he hid when she brought him down there. Like, who knows? But he sees his mom all crazy right now, and he's like, God, it's twice in this movie that I've seen her go real ham, real <laughs> primal, and it's pretty crazy. Yeah. But then immediately when she sees her son, she's back, and she's like, oh, my God, and she's safe. I'm glad you're alive. I'm bleeding a lot. Let's go back up. Stairs. So that's this at this point, the second act's over, right? This is where we get start the resolution of the story. Uh, what did did I miss anything? Is there anything else you wanted to highlight? You want to give your thoughts of this part of the the second act of the movie? No, nope, I'm still loving the second act. Um, I do want to say that somewhere around the Tyler House is where, in my opinion, the movie starts to leave the horror genre and into the thriller or suspenseful genre. I still think it was done with absolute professionality. I still think the writing is fantastic, the humor is fantastic, the cinematography. Honestly, I think it actually just gets better and better as the movie goes on. Yeah. Um, so I've got no complaints other than the fact that, I, you know, if you if you are expecting a full-blown horror from start to finish, know that somewhere around halfway through the movie, it goes away from the horror-ish-esque. There's still creepy vibes. I still enjoy the creepiness because creepy, in my opinion, is actually better horror than the pop-out horror. Right. Um, so you still have, it still is classified as a horror genre, but you just start to leave the feel, you know, because then you get some more of the humor and some of the quirkiness and some of the funniness starts to, you know, expose itself. And it's still enjoyable, but yes, we just kind of leave some of the horrorness. That's about it. I mean, I still really enjoyed the second act, you know. Um, yeah, and you, you can you can argue that that second or the, the final confrontation between Adelaide and Red Adelaide is very... I guess it is more suspenseful than horror because horror, they're, they're chasing you. But in this sense, the our hero is chasing the bad guy, which is a little bit different. I think that's maybe kind of where we're getting away yeah. from horror a little bit. Um, unless we find out that our hero was the bad person all along, <laughs> then maybe this was a horror movie. Um, <laughs> so... The wrap-up, it's a real quick third act. We'll blaze through it real quick, because all that really happens is that the family survives. They've been through some stuff. They meet back up with Gabe and Zora at the ambulance. Uh, I believe they take that as their getaway car. I get, Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. The expensive SUVs, the fuel line's cut, so it probably can't do much anymore. But they, they choose that as their escape vehicle. Um, right? Yeah, they yeah. pull off in the, in the ambulance. Yeah, but I don't know if they switch cars because the final the final scene. Um, I can't remember. Anyway, so, so what's important is that in the final part of this movie, the the, the 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 conclusion of the third act is Adelaide's driving and Jason is in passenger seat. Gabe's in the back, recovering from a broken knee and probably being stabbed a few times. Can't remember. And Zora's <laughs> hanging out back there, probably listening to her her phone uh, with her headphones, which she's been doing the entire movie. Um, she still probably has the, the putter of destruction. Uh, I'm sure she probably kept that. <laughs> the putter of destruction. <laughs> yes! I love it. <laughs> and we get, we, we can tell Adelaide's been, you know, kind of out of it right now, but she's driving. And we get cuts back to the, the flashbacks again of what started the catalyst of this movie, of her going down to the Hall of Mirrors. And we finally get the full context of the events that happened. So she meets her doppelganger. You see the doppelganger actually turn around this time. You see the doppelganger have the evil smile. Mm -hmm. She grabs Adelaide by the throat. And then we see doppelganger Adelaide drag uh, Real Adelaide. Adelaide Real Adelaide down. Uh, we see a whole lot of her life as well, of context of how the life in the underground was, mm -hmm. where it eerily mirrors... Um, the life is up and down, right? And I think they actually explained that probably before their final battle. I probably okay. missed it, but they, but essentially that whole scene where they're at, at the uh, the amusement park gets mirrored in a weird, crazy doppelganger mirror version in the underground. So like the white people eating, the, that white couple, the teenagers feeding each other was real weird. They're eating down there. But the 
the dad has a cup of, like it was his beer, but he's not talking because no one knows English. And they seem to be bickering. And she's walking just, it's like a weird mirror image for above and, the, and below of them living a similar life, but they're underground and they don't have like things to look at. We, you see people, uh, you see doppelgangers, like they're in a roller coaster and they're like, well, I just stand yeah. in a room <laughs> as if that's what they're doing. Um, uh. And she also gets a shirt just like she got it. Her dad got her a shirt. She puts a shirt on just like uh, it wasn't above ground, but I don't think it was a thriller shirt. I think it was just a shirt that was available. Yeah. Um, but either way, this is to tie to the point that they're co copies of each other, but their souls attract. And that's why they both met where they did, was they both had some kind of urge or pull to go meet there. And you see, like I said, doppelganger chokes her, brings down Adelaide downstairs. No one seems to care downstairs that this one girl's dragging another girl. Nope. That's the forest down here, I guess. I don't know. And we see a very similar looking pair of handcuffs from earlier in the movie get put on Adelaide with the thriller shirt on the on the book bed. Underground doppelganger Adelaide grabs the shirt off of her, probably before she cuffs her, because it'd be really hard to get it off if she cuffs her first. <laughs> and <clears throat> puts it on and just has the evil smile. And then we learn that, oh shit, the Adelaide that our hero of the story was actually doppelganger Adelaide the entire time. Yeah. And it it completely readjusts the whole scope of this film considering knowing that knowledge now and going back and looking at everything uh why she was scared to go back why she thought someone was coming after her because she knew it might happen someday <laughs> why she knew shit was bad from the very beginning like it changes everything and we see all this in her mind and we go back to her uh driving the ambulance our hero slash evil adelaide and Jason's just like looking at her and like, he kind of like, you could tell he puts it in his head together. He's like, I don't, I think she was something well, wrong. I don't know. Go ahead. He also probably heard the conversation. Not that yeah. she is, not that her dictation is beautiful. You know, the, the red evil Adelaide, you know what I mean? But like, he's got enough wherewithal to start trying to ask questions. He's curious. Clearly he's a curious boy. Right. So I, I think, you know, clearly you notice that he recognizes the fact that, wait a minute, you know, uh, eh, something's off here. Yeah. So what we learn, uh, and I, I guess I'll finish it and we'll come back and talk about it later, but we see a great shot of Adelaide smirking, like kind of like a little smirk, like she got away with it. Right, that's essentially what I got from that. She's like, I, I got it. I'm away, I'm never going back, I'm never go down there again. And we see that the Hands of Cross in America it stretches far longer than what you thought it was possible. It wasn't just across the street. Well, now they're and across the, the ocean. At least that's what the symbolism it, is. Because there's it's, people go into an ocean and then it ends, and you're like, do they, do they keep going? Like, yeah. is where it stops. <laughs> but we see like. As the ambulance goes away, we see it around the rolling hills is the line of people holding hands, super organized, and helicopters looking at them and being like, "What the hell is going on here?" Like, and clearly, if the helicopters are watching them, someone didn't do their job. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> someone has not done their job anyway. Yeah. So that's kind of like the end of the movies. We get a zoom out and seeing that this, that the whole group of doppelgangers has now formed a hands across America in their red shirts because in the commercial they were all red. Yeah. And that's kind of where the movie ends. And it's over. Uh, and so we're, we're done recapping it. But uh, the interesting thing that I want to go back to now that we're done is that now everything makes sense. Why they wore red. Why they have a glove on the right hand and not the left hand. Mac Michael Jackson call out. Why they did the hands across America uh, decision to do that. Uh, why Red Adelaide is the only one that can speak and no one else can. It was the original Adelaide who was understandably upset that she got her life taken away from her and then rustled up all of these doppelgangers to eventually plan and execute this plan to kill everyone on the top, the top uh, above and make a symbol, a statement by having the, literally hands stretched across America that's what she executed and it makes sense to me because she was seven-ish 
she just saw that commercial. That was the last thing she saw on the four by three TV. And she's insane at this point. Probably went insane real quickly after being down there with people that are essentially yeah. pro Magnon or like they just <laughs> they, they don't talk, they just walk around. Who knows how they're as as it's a mere thing, right? As rough of a transition was for Doppelganger Adelaide to adjust to a normal life, it was also really hard for regular Adelaide to adjust to Doppelganger life, right? Yeah. You can and so the mirroring still happens. They are in different positions now, but they're still tethered and their souls still mimic each other. But it answers those questions of why those decisions were made. But there are a lot of questions uh, left, like well, and questions that it brings up, right? Like, yeah. uh, where did they get the clothes? Uh, um, Who's they cloned to everyone, and yeah. no one knows. <laughs> How does no one know about these clones? And then you're going to separate them between an escalator. And it only goes mirrors in California. <laughs> it only goes down. You can't go up an escalator, man. That's not how it works. Well, apparently a seven-year-old uh, can figure it out. Well, everyone else is dumb. And I can fully, they were not smart. So if they saw an escalator well, is, and tried to how talk is she it, any smarter than anyone else? She's special. She's special. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, we'll, no, we'll it, wrap that into the she's special bow, and therefore don't ask questions anymore. <laughs> she could crawl up the side. Um, but where the clones from? Come from? Where did the red clothes they get come from? Right. The someone's got to be taking care of them, right? Someone's yeah. got to be supporting the electricity. Someone's got to, you know what I mean? Like, come on. Who, who's the, the right scientist way. behind cloning the bunnies so that they have food? Because clearly they're too stupid to do this, and clearly they're yeah. ravagely eating them. <laughs> but there's always an endless supply of rabbits. Um, Maybe it's because they all, as the saying goes, you know, when you f like rabbits, there's just like. Maybe there's just an abundance of rabbits because they're always having sex down there. Who knows? Yeah, but these are, and this is what I was saying when the beginning, kind of like a quick view. There's definitely questions that are left unanswered, and to me, I'm fine with them not really being answered. Like it doesn't bother me. I was totally into the story, and it ends, and I was like, the twist wasn't a twist. Uh, the 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 execution of the twist or the twist that happened is not what's important to, to me. Uh, me being surprised by it, what, what I think is important to me is the lens it now puts on the entire movie now that we know that officially that doppelganger Adelaide is the one living the real life. That's what I like about it. That's why I like having conversations with you about all the things that happened up until this point, making a hell of a lot more sense uh, because we know she's doppelganger her as opposed to regular Adelaide. Um, so yeah, and, and you can tell me how you felt about the ending, but I, I thought it was great. Um, I, I enjoyed it quite a bit, and I enjoy the conversations it's bringing between us yeah. now that we watch it. Um, no, I, I still like the movie. I still really like the movie. You know, you can't, you, look, you can't separate talent, um, you know, and, you know, one of the reasons why I have a, a four, you know, why I rate movies on that four-point system um writing acting cinematography and directing is because ultimately you can't grade one thing you, you can't just because some one thing was bad you can't say that the movie's bad and one of the things i hate when pe other people other reviewers say this um let's say the movie connects with them in some way a social way a political way uh, an emotional way an intellectual way whatever it doesn't matter ultimately that will outweigh the other aspects of the movie for them so a movie could have, like, there are movies that you love that are actually terrible movies, right? Mm -hmm. And there are movies that I love that are actually terrible movies. And it's because of the way we relate to them or how we feel about them. But when it comes to, like, talking to other people and movie watchers and you, there's got to be some system. There's got to be a checks and balance somewhere that says, okay, look, just because I really enjoyed the movie doesn't mean that everyone's going to. It doesn't mean that you can categorize this as a fantastic movie. I still mm -hmm. really like the movie, you know? And if you look at my review, which I'll be posting in, you know, in a day or two, um, I give like one or I think it's one or two things have like a bad score and then one or two things almost have a perfect score. So I mm -hmm. think ultimately I end up coming out with the movie being like a six and a half out of 10, you know what I mean? Which by 
grading scale, you know, I know that sounds like it's failing if you count 70 as passing, but actually you don't. If you really count anything above six as good, you know what I mean? And then really, really into, it's not until you get to nine or 10, technically a nine or 10 would be almost a perfect movie, which very few things are actually going to get. So it's actually, six and a half is actually a pretty good rating for a movie. Um, at least at least how I grade, that's actually a pretty good rating for a movie. If I think the movie's bad, it's going to have to be less than five, you know. Um, but ultimately, the only thing I don't like is the ending. And it's because, I don't know if you remember, but there was a time in the late 90s, early millennia, where like all of the horror movies that were out at that time were doing this whole... Um, you know, they had all this thriller and this suspense, and then right at the end, the twist is, oh, well, someone was bipolar or someone was schizophrenic, and that was just their second personality that was doing this the whole time. And you're kind of like, that's a dumb way, in my opinion. Like, when you do it so much, it's a dumb way to end a movie, in my opinion. And this isn't like that, necessarily, but to throw the twist where she's actually the one that's been down there the whole time, in my opinion, brings up more questions than answers. And it's kind of like, it actually, the movie actually makes better sense, in my opinion, if the our hero Adelaide is the scared Adelaide that barely got out of the Hall of Mirrors, but got out in fear and was terrorized, in my opinion. That makes the story better. So to say that she's the other Adelaide... You know, I mean, I start having, like, consistency issues, in my opinion, with, you know, how she adapts to the world and how she views the world. Because at seven years old, man, you've got a pretty, you've got a pretty set. It doesn't seem like you do, but your raising largely changes who you are. And most of your, you have massive amounts of development as a child. You know, the, the difference between being born and seven years old is greater than the difference between seven and, like, 30 like, the amount of development your brain undergoes is massive, you know what I mean? So, like, I didn't, okay, so I guess to say that I hate it is wrong. I just had, like, to me it felt like a, I want to throw a twist in here, so how do I twist it? What do I do? Oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to switch the roles on them, and then everyone will be blown away. I'm kind of like, no, actually, I, I called it in the first ten minutes, and I was kind of like, man, I really wish it, I really just wish we had a different ending. Everything about the movie is fantastic. I just wish that one part was a little different. Yeah, well, as we all know, landing the plane at the end is probably the hardest part of storytelling. Um, and it's but I, I think, sorry, I think some people will hate the movie because of the ending. Because there are some movies where the ending ultimately makes the movie not worth watching. I don't think that's this movie, but it could be for some people. Yeah, I would say that it, it's fat. The ending, like I said, wasn't necessarily in the fact that it was a twist. I just think it paints. This is a movie I want to watch again, knowing that that is the person the entire time. I think I'll get a lot out of it. Uh, and that's kind of why I like the, that ending. Uh, I think it like makes sense. I think it, it grasps the... It makes sense that the Red Adelaide would have this plot to get back because she's seen what life is above and is real angry and gets everyone riled up. And that's the reason they, they revolt is because at that point, no one knows what the upside is like. And she's the one, they kind of start raising her as a messiah. I think she was like, that's when the miracle happened. And everyone started following her because she's the one that's pretty much with the IQ above 100, I guess, down there. <laughs> um, and it makes sense to me for her to be so angsty, so, so angry, and to have this weird plan to just murder the entire population to take take it back like it all that made sense to me conversely it makes sense to me as well for doppelganger adelaide to want to get out because she might be the only one even when she was walking around she's noticing things she's it, she seemed to be a little uh, smarter than everyone else on there at least aware that this is really weird and i don't for sure. want to be here and she gets out and lives her life and has her family and is extremely loving of her family and for the most part slightly adjusted, well adjusted. Like she eventually comes around to just be like yeah. a normal person. I mean, with minor anxiety, I'd say she's perfectly normal. Yeah. You know. Um, so yeah, I I, I, I I disagree. I like the ending. It didn't bother me at all. I thought it was pretty cool. But it's it, there's different movies where like the twist is it's more on the surprise meaning something. And for me, it was less about that. Like I kind of put it together before the twist happened. But, but 
it's more of the ramifications in the story up until that point and what it means and the different lens you should look at things. Like there's that right. key point where where she's like, oh, do you ever wish she kept dancing? She's like, oh, you know, she points to her leg like she can't, she just couldn't do it anymore. It was because um, I've talked to you about the before we start recording that that um, that dream sequence or that memory sequence was confusing to me because you had above ground Adelaide being perfect, like perfect, a really good ballet dancer in the under one, undergrad one, that doppelganger one, not being that good at all. It's just very a different, not what we would consider good ballet, I guess is a good way to put it. Um, so beautiful in itself, but that's the dynamic that we're showing and why they fought so differently than I thought. I would thought above ground Adelaide would be the one that's totally smooth and that. So that's where I think that that memory of them dancing happened before the switch. So the good dancer was a uh, normal Adelaide and the bad dancer was doppelganger Adelaide. So when they switched, she was a bad dancer and so she stopped dancing. Yeah. While the real Adelaide kept dancing. Maybe I don't know if she danced on there. She has nothing else to do. Um, so the, the really the one issue that I have with the ending, if if you go back to the first act when uh, evil Adelaide, you know, they infiltrate the house and they're sitting across from each other, that infamous, beautiful scene that's in the movie, she, she kind of starts to explain what's going on. And one of the things that she says is that essentially that they've cloned people, don't know who, but the purpose for it was to attempt to control the people from above. Right. She does this in her, her awesome, really cool voice. So ultimately, when you tie when you tie these two pieces of the story together, okay, if you have the clones that are underneath, and your goal is to use them to control the people above, and she does explain that something goes wrong, um, but ultimately, what you have is people people and above and below are essentially exact copies of each other with those souls tied together, one being hopefully being used to control the other one, which essentially means that. Essentially, one has to mirror the other. You cannot have a difference. One is designed perfectly to mirror the other. So whatever, and she even explains, it's like, you married Gabe, therefore I had to marry him. And you gave me this, you know, you had a daughter or whatever, and so I had to have the daughter, right? So throughout the story, you have, you know, the ending, in my opinion, completely contradicts this concept. Because essentially what it says is at the age of seven, um, Adelaide's the only person to have ever entered the Hall of Mirrors, because if anyone has ever gone in the Hall of Mirrors, then they're all, their doppelganger has also gone into the Hall of Mirrors. You know what I mean? Like, according to this, according to this direct line that you have now established as law in the movie, and this is kind of where, you know, I start to get really technical. When you say something is law in the movie, everything after this now has to follow and walk that same line. Um, and I'm kind of like, okay, she's the only person, she's you know, not that she's not smart, not that she's not special by any means, but she's the only person to run into herself in the Hall of Mirrors. And you could actually argue this to say that no, the actual Jeremiah 1111 guy could have also actually ran into himself in the Hall of Mirrors. Um, but either way, from what we can tell, they're the only ones that have. And not only were they not mimicking each other, but the one who was below, who was supposed to be less intelligent, but also designed to control the one above, you know what I mean? Like actually has the wherewithal to understand at seven years old and to know your life is better than mine. I want your life. So you're going to, you and I are now going to switch play. You know what I mean? Like, like that's a lot in my opinion, a lot of information and really hard to relay. But in my opinion, if they stayed away from, like I would have liked it. Like there's a couple, this is kind of a thing on Netflix right now where they don't explain how things, they don't explain why things are happening. And the movies are actually still pretty good. I watched some of them. They literally don't tell you anything. All you get is the experience of the person, which is raw, which is essentially something's going on and I have to survive it. And that's mm -hmm. all you get. You literally have no idea the whole time what's happening in the movie. And at the end of it, you're like, half of you is like, that's dumb. I want to know what the bad guy is, or I want to know what the enemy is, or I want to know what's happening, but you don't get that. All you get is the experience of the person. I think they should have done that in this movie. I think they should have left telling us, I think if she just doesn't say these are clones and 
we create, you know, they were created to control the people from, you know what I mean? If you just leave that part out, then you don't have a law to it. You didn't, you didn't establish a law that everything now has to abide by. And now whatever you want to happen can happen without criticism because you have nothing to compare it to. It's just happening. You're just watching the experience, you know what I mean, of the characters, which I think would have been the best way to do it in my personal opinion. Yeah, but that leaves any many more unanswered questions if we do that route. But I will say that your explanation of that law actually makes the movie make more sense to me. Because Does it? <laughs> if, if the law is that the doppelgangers were made to control the people above, meaning that the actions of the doppelgangers were the ones for the reason why the people above the above the ground lived their lives, how they were living them, that whenever you have the switch happen, the power of who controls the life is still the doppelganger. So you have her marrying Jer uh, marrying uh, Gabe, and that's why she said, I had to marry this doofus. Yeah. And I had to have daughter because you're still in control. Your life dictates mine. And right. that relationship hasn't changed from the swap. It's just they Agreed. are in different locations now. Different positions, yeah. Yeah. So that means the only weird part is her whole re revolution planning breaks the trend. But you imagine if this is a machine where doppelgangers' lives dictate mindless American consumers' lives. Yeah. Um, That's a good way to put it. <laughs> that once that machine gets broken, once there's a cog or a, a disturbance in that, then you can probably, I'm okay with them having this weird revolution uh, led by the one person who actually is smart enough to be angsty about it and like want to start this. And I'm also, I don't know, it, it kind of makes sense to me that that's what happened. And so yeah. like that, 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 I don't share that criticism with you, but I understand it. Um, but I just had fun. And I know like the movies you're talking about on Netflix, like uh, there's a one horror one with these dudes that were British in the middle of nowhere. They wanted to hike for like their buddy's bachelor party or something. And then they go into the forest and there's this weird monster. It's like a moose. Yeah. And yeah. One, that movie. <laughs> the ritual or something maybe? No. So, yeah, it's something like that. But that, that one, they didn't really explain it. Yeah. And like, like the other one, I really enjoyed, I think it's called How It Ends or The End or something okay. like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they just don't explain the ending, you know. But in my opinion, it's, you know, just you don't have a, you don't have set rules that I feel like now everything has to be tied in together with. Um, yeah. Because like, you know, every time we, every time we get the flashback from Adelaide, we essentially, like, especially with them at the amusement park, we see doppelganger mom and dad mimicking the exact same thing that adelaide in the real world was doing you know what i mean like you said they weren't talking but they were still doing their they were they were literally everything was just a mirror image of itself which is the theme throughout the whole movie right look at yourself like the reflections you know what i mean um you know what i mean like i just i like it felt like everything followed in perfect track and in perfect order and everything made so much sense and i was with everything and then they switched then they switched the two roles and i'm like well now i have to question the whole line now i have to go back and be like okay well you know did everything still keep on track because now that they're reversed and i get what you're saying and i agree with you it just because their position switched does not mean that the role that which they play switched right Maybe just their location did, but their titles or their positions with one another stays the same, right? The doppelganger is right. still in control of real Adelaide, essentially. So what, what if this is it? Let's, let's think about this. So the minute the switch happens, the machine is messed up. The, the doppelgangers are now planning to start a revolution to overthrow their above-ground counterparts. And let's say that that happens, and so now the people who were controlled are now not controlled anymore like maybe because if, if it was a perfect mirror image like you're saying then they would be planning a revolution up top two uh, or that's something. what i'm saying according to that law yeah that would be what was happening but i'm i'm more okay to think about it as like it's broken now like what was a machine that was per working in perfect order is now yeah. screwed and then it's all, now the people above ground are allowed to live their lives and that's why they had people who buy stupid suvs and uh, Olivia, uh, Billia, exactly. and exactly. that's a, a reflection of our current culture and life. Thing yeah. that we're we are we have freedom, but we're just wasting it and it's being mm. stupid. And 
maybe we deserve a revolution or something like maybe that. So that's interesting. I actually kind of like some of the, those themes that it brings to it. And I'm sure there's people are smarter than us that can dive into the opinions of consumerism that are displayed in this movie. Um, why they make it such a point that the Tyler family has all the good stuff. And, um, but yeah, no, this movie's fun and it has a conversation. That's why I wanted to talk about it. I felt it was going to be a movie that was worth talking about and we've already at like an hour 45. So I think we stretched this out long enough. Do you have any other final thoughts before no. we sign off? Um, I'm going to reaffirm Lupita's acting though. Um, based on, now I will say this, I do think her acting as Evil Adelaide far or vastly overshadows her acting is but i think the role is different so maybe it's not fair to compare the two but there were like a couple of moments as real adelaide who i guess was donald i don't know anyway um, <laughs> there are real you know there are some moments where i'm like not as not as good as i think it could have been but as evil adelaide like hands hands down absolutely absolutely stunning absolutely amazing performance blown yeah. away actually is my literally just that first scene i'm like in the theater i'm like holy crap this lady can freaking act man pure genius i thought amazing no, I, she did great she did great we can keep talking about it for a long time but that's i think that's, we, yeah, that's we're good just beating a dead horse now yeah and i think we kind of uh, expressed everything we wanted to express about this movie is there anything else i want to think about uh, he did mention Jordan Peele, that is, in the interview, that he has a backstory for this entire universe. Oh, cool. So there, so there is, a, he has the answers, uh, and he did that mainly because he says if you don't have those answers, then the audiences can tell uh, in your writing that you don't have answers. So, like, I'm sure if you look at his notebook, you'll know why there's clones yeah, and I would love why to this is that. all happening. Um, and he can maybe reveal that in another movie, does need to, does um, I would be for or against. Like, if he doesn't, if he decides he doesn't want to come back to this universe, cool. It doesn't bother me. Uh, I'm fine with the story how it is. But if he does come back, I'd be like, okay, you could get, you give it a shot. But it's tough to come back and explain everything in a satisfactory way that everyone will enjoy. Yeah, he should, right? he should just leave it, in my opinion. Her, well, let the, the movie of, speak for itself. If people love it, they love it. If they don't, they don't, whatever. Yeah because the people that do want those questions answered might not like the answers they get. And that's kind of what happens. Uh, the beginning trilogy of Star Wars, for instance. Right. Uh, episodes one through three. Like, some people really didn't like those answers, but it's like, well, you asked one. <laughs> like, um, I mean, he, he didn't do himself any favors by calling the first one episode four, you know? Like, right, yeah. He was, right. <laughs> he was gonna have to, <laughs> he was gonna have to answer him anyway, but... Okay, um, so do we know what next week's going to be? Um, do we have an idea? Uh, next week, I don't think anything major is coming out next week. Well, if you called this one my choice, then that would make it your choice. Um, this is not behind Shazam baseball right now. Next week? That's in April. Shazam and Pet Cemetery is going to be a, a double banger that I'm not quite sure how we're going to figure out. Um, Let's see, Dumbo, The Best of Enemies, Pet Cemetery, April 5th, Shazam, April 5th, uh, April 19th, April 12th. No, I guess we're open next week. Okay, Beach Bum, that's a movie that's coming out apparently. Um, okay, I might have to figure out what I want to do. I could say, let's keep with the theme and watch Get Out. I could say... Let's watch another horror movie where the main actress nails it in Hereditary. Um, which one would you prefer of those two? Well, I know nothing about Hereditary, so I would rather watch Hereditary. But okay, that's I love that movie. I own it, and I need to watch it again, so I'm totally okay with it. I do not own it, so I'm gonna have to figure out how to get it. But I can do that. Uh, Hereditary. It will be next week. Let's do it. Uh, also, real quick before we run out, uh, I dropped the ball and didn't realize that the video had been uploaded, so I owe you guys a podcast for Captain Marvel. It's not out there yet, but the video is live, but the podcast is not. So you might just get two podcasts back-to-back -back real quick this week. One for Captain Marvel and one for us. Uh, my bad. Uh, this week's going to be interesting. Uh, or last week was pretty rough. Uh, hour change, and I was not feeling that hot. But I, I had to work that. a bunch. Most of it's my fault, just so you movie watchers know. I 
my job is in the busy season right now, so my workload sometimes is exponentially higher. But we'll keep working. I think we're hopefully we can get in a rhythm. So far, we're getting the rhythm. We're shooting on Sundays. Uh, I don't know when Travis posts the videos from Sunday. So if you, you film it Sunday, when are you posting it? Well, last week I posted it right away. Um, this one, I may not post till Monday or Tuesday. Okay. So Wednesday, that might be a good rhythm, Sunday for the video, Wednesday for the podcast. I think I can probably do that. That might be working. But hopefully we'll get in the rhythm. Uh, we're trying to figure out what works best. We finally have a best day time to shoot, so we don't have to worry about that anymore. Yeah. Then we'll hopefully, through you know, cause and effect, we will then have a normal timeline. We are going to start posting these things. But bear with us. We're still trying to figure it out. Uh, I felt that was a great episode. Uh, we didn't really have any plans for this episode, and I feel like we knocked out of the park. Um, I only watched it once, so uh, hopefully I caught everything. I thought about watching it again, but I woke up. I woke up at 6 a.m., and I was like, DC needs saving. I need I to go take you. DC. I hear you completely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, movie watchers. Do you want to close it out, Travis? Do you have things to say? Yes. Movie Thanks, watchers? movie watchers, for watching us. Anything that you want to say, if you loved it, if you hated it, let us, let us know. Again, we are here. We want to talk about movies with you. We don't just want to post videos. And yeah, I know Ke that's a sweet trick. Kevin and I talk movies together, but we want you to be a part of it. So hit us up on the Movie Watcher Club Facebook group. Go to Facebook, type in the Movie Watcher Club. It's a thing. Uh, guys, you can talk to us there. You can talk to us on YouTube. We actually want to talk to you about movies. Don't just say, this movie sucked. You've got nothing I can do with that. I, okay, I understand yeah. it if you loved it or if you hated it. Like, I get that. But, you know what I mean? Like, we want to, we like talking about this stuff. Our, believe it or not, Kevin and I's discussion doesn't didn't start here and doesn't end here either. So we want you guys to be a part of all of it. So connect with us, reach out to us, whatever. We're going to talk back to you. Um, I don't have anything else. we got more reviews, more discussions coming your way. We've got a lot of movies coming out, um, mm. specifically April and May. They're going to be big months. Um, so stay tuned, guys. Join, join us for those. We're going to have a lot of fun. Yeah. A lot of fun in April, actually. Pretty excited about it. So, yeah, two, two things before we leave. I'm going to stretch this out longer than it should. Do uh, it. Music starts playing right now. Music right now. Um, two things. Uh, it's for an example of a good comment or post or discussion point, it, I would love to see if someone posts the, the discussion. Let's talk about how us has made putters the weapons of mass destruction of our new age. <laughs> that would be a good discussion what did you point. Call it? What was the name of it? What that was on? Oh, uh, putter of destruction. Putter of destruction. Yeah, <laughs> putter of destruction. Uh, Brilliant. So that would be a good discussion point. Uh, secondly, I'm actually going down to Travis in yeah. April, so we might have an opportunity to record a live version of the show, or at least we're in the same room. Um, we have to work those things out. It, it, it might just be two camera, like my camera, his camera, and it might seem a little silly, but we. We need to try and test this out. It could fail utterly because we don't, we've don't. we never done it before. <laughs> so it might end up just being a, not a great video, but a good audio. Like we could definitely record a podcast easily in the same room, but it's not that big a deal. But the, the video component might be a little bit of a challenge, but we'll give it a shot because I'll be down there anyways. And also it's the worst weekend I could have picked to visit because we have Pet Cemetery, which I'm gonna want, we're gonna have a show about. And Shazam, which we should have a show about. Yeah, um, and I'm not sure if we could do them both in the same weekend, or if we might have to do. If we did, we pick Shazam first, just do the popularity of that movie, and then the following week maybe knock Pet Cemetery out, um, or knock them out both that weekend. I don't know. It depends on how busy we are, but yeah. I think that's a pretty, that'd be a cool opportunity to shoot it live, and we'll see what happens. Maybe we'll get it. Maybe we will fail spectacularly. Um, Either way, we'll be doing it with smiles on our faces, at least mine. You'll be frustrated. Uh, I'll just be like, I can't, I can't solve your problem. <laughs> <laughs> and for all of you at that. home, I do all the technical aspects. Um, yeah. And I don't know that much about it, so it's just kind of been a learn as you go, which you could probably tell from the first videos with the way the audio was or the way the picture was. We got a pretty good setup now. It's because I've been learning as I've been going, you know. I'm the movie watcher. I'm not normally the camera audio guy, but today I'm both. Yeah. Yep. Well, uh, thanks for coming, guys. We will see you next week. Um, good job, Chuck. Thank you.
Amber out. Out. Later. Hand signal. Stomach. 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 This is the creepy kid on the street.